Um, let's, uh, would you stand with me? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for one another. We thank you for your presence here. We thank you for what we have already heard, God, and received edification from. And we, God, as we get into your word, we want you to speak to us. And I thank you so much, God, for this word being, being, being something that you're speaking to me and showing me, God. And I thank you so much, Holy Spirit, that you would bring this word to life, that in, 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 a, in a custom tailored way that you would bring this word into the life of every individual here and speak to them what they need to hear. Maybe it's not exactly what I receive, but something else that they need to hear. God, I just thank you, Holy Spirit, so much that you know the place that every single one of us is at and the word that we need to hear. And I pray for all of our ears to open. We can get so used to church, so used to sermons, so used to being together, but I just pray, refresh us, refresh us today to hear and to be awake to hear, spiritually awake to hear what you want to say to us. We don't want, to, we don't want that word to be taken away. We don't, want, we don't want to miss that word. We want to receive that word. And we thank you so much. We bless this place. I come against every distraction. I come against every discouragement. I come against all forms of condemnation in Jesus' mighty name. And I pray that in this moment, they would hear the word, that they would hear you, Holy Spirit. And I thank you, God, that that word is going to bring life into their situation, bring life into them. It's going to change and turn things around. And we, we believe that. We pray that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, take a seat, please. You know, uh, today um, I was able to be at both morning services because we had a little, I'm not going to get into it, but we had a little accident with Anastasia yesterday, and she just wrecked her face against asphalt, uh, and um, I told her to be careful, and asphalt is not very nice, kind of harsh, like Vika sometimes. I'm just kidding. Um, she said it, not me, and uh, she uh, had an accident, hit the, hit the asphalt, and so Obviously, we didn't want to bring her to church because people just, you know, think we beat our kids or something. Um, it's just bad jokes after bad jokes. I'm so sorry. Um, thanks, guys. Yeah, I'm sweating up here, man. Um, and, but yeah, she kind of did look jacked up. And she, one of the, one of the, one of the, you know, saddest but cutest things she's ever said to me, uh, she like looks at me with these eyes and one eye is like swollen and it's got like, te it's like teary, it's like swollen. She's already got like big cheeks and you know, she's kind of fluffy. And now she looks even fluffier and she looks at me, she's like, Dad, Avia and Micah, these are like her, one of her, one of her two best friends at school. Avia and Micah are gonna laugh at me. And she just starts crying. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I had to, parents have to lie sometimes. I'm like, they're not gonna laugh at you. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to laugh. <laughs> they're not gonna laugh at you. And, uh, and so we couldn't make it to church. She couldn't, she couldn't make it to church this morning, so I could stay for both services. Why I'm sharing this is after second service, my wife gave me, a, you know, just being a good husband that I am, she gave me a list of groceries that I have to get. All right, <laughs> the crowd goes silent. Um, and so she gave me a list of groceries, and I went to the store to get some groceries. And uh, she did this to me where she sent me multiple messages of groceries, and uh, and when I went to the store, I pull up and really quick, I, I look through the messages and I copy, copy them to my notes. And so I run in, like I, that's just my game plan when I go to the store is I have a list and she actually puts the things in order. Literally, I walk into the store and I just start finding these things as I, as I follow the magic trail. And so she gave me this list and I end up not copying one of the messages. I didn't see it because it was like earlier and then we texted back and forth a little bit. And so I come home She's prepared lunch, and there's things in that first message that I had to bring that are a part of the lunch. And so my wife's already kind of like, Vlad, what's up, man? Come take a seat, brother. Hey, man. Everybody say, hey, Vlad. Hey, brother. It's Lion King. It really is. It's him. Oh, my gosh. I always put him on the spot. Sit down, dog. Come on. Come in the front. Come to the front. Everybody, just give him a round of applause. Oh my gosh, his hair. Oh my gosh, his hair. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and um, uh, I get home, I get home, I get home, and my wife's like, no, can you imagine four kids, four kids under five years old by herself at home? And so she's like putting, trying to put the twins to sleep, and she's just hustling. She's hustling, and I made the mistake of missing that first message. It's a miracle that I'm here. Uh, and I 
I, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I got frustrated. I'm like, because I'm hungry. <laughs> like, I didn't eat in the morning. Two services, it's three o'clock. I haven't eaten yet. Somebody help me out, brothers. Help me out, homies. And so um, it's three o'clock, and I'm like, I, I love you. I'll go to the store again. And I, you know, I really meant that. And I ran out the door, and I ran to the store again. And I'm kind of frustrated going to the store. I'm like, like I, I just wanted to eat my meal, rest a little bit, and I got to, you know, youth prepare and everything. And I just need my time. And so I end up rushing, rushing to the store, and I, I'm flying into the store. And as I'm like in a hurry, I'm thankfully just had to be in one department to get these things I missed. And as I'm there, I'm kind of like, I want to be really quick and out the door. And the second item I go to grab, I get in, I get in this lady's way. I kind of like cut her off. <laughs> yeah, I'm that dude with the mask and everything, you know. <laughs> and I get in her way, I get in her way, and she's like this old, like, just like, you know, fragile lady walking with her cart. And so I, like, I get in her way, and I look to her, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Hey, how are you? You know, I just try to make a means to, you know, mend some things. And so I grab it. And I'm like, how are, you? how are you? And, you know, usually people just kind of blow you off like, good. And, you know, keep, walk, keep walking with their, you know, <laughs> you know, and they just keep going their direction. But she actually stopped and she's like, you know, all right, you know. I could tell, like, she wanted to say more. And I'm like, no, I think, I'm, you know, I think, and I grab my, grab my thing, and, I, and we're kind of looking for things in the same area, and so we're like, <laughs> we're like, it was really interesting, like, there's people walking around, but like, it's like her and I know each other, and as we're looking for stuff, we're just like talking at a distance, it's just really awkward, we're just talking, but it feels totally normal, and we're just kind of talking, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, you look great, <laughs> yeah, I said that, you know, uh, and she's got, a, she's got a mask on. She's got a mask on. She's an old lady, and she really does look great. I'm like, you look great. I'm like, I think, I think you're doing all right. And she's like, yeah, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise, yeah, I'm, I'm, praise the Lord. And then she keeps looking for her stuff. I'm like, all right, this, this lady's going to be easy to talk to. She said, praise the Lord. Uh, our people. You know, so, and, and I'm looking for stuff, and we, keep, and we just have, we literally have a genuine heart-to-heart, five-minute conversation in the produce aisle and as I'm there, I'm like, God, I thank you that even this kind of stuff is your setup. And maybe, I, I, you know, I'm being used by God. No, she was being used by God to encourage me. And I'm there, and we have this little conversation. She's 82 years old. Now, the whole, like, brutal joking thing I made, not the case at all. This woman could maybe run past me. She, she looked like she was in her 60s. She's 82, and ladies, I got a secret for you. She drinks, she said, green juice every morning. All right. The guys are taking that instead of the girls. Drink green juice. And she was in the produce aisle grabbing all these green things, and I'm like, does that even taste good? She's like, I put some berries in it, and this, and this, and that, and I make it taste good, honey. She's 82 years old, her husband's 84. They've been married for 64 years. I'm like, I've been married for six. And she's like, you got a long way to go. She looks at me. And married for 64 years, really quick, just like told me about her husband and how he's spiritually growing in this season like never before. He's on some, he's on some intensive Bible reading plan that takes like three or four years. He's 84, dude, hurry up. Uh, uh, <laughs> come on, guys, just work with me here. Uh, from some intensive Bible reading plan, three or four years long, where he's like literally going by fragments of the Bible and studying in depth. And, and she's like, she's like, and she just told me something I needed to hear. She's like, you know, um, I'm like, you know, it was such a pleasure meeting you. And then we, you know, her name is Bonnie. Such a pleasure meeting you, Bonnie. And I'm really glad that I had to come back here and, you know, we got to talk. And she's like, just keep praising the Lord. He's coming back soon. She said it with such boldness. She said it and she didn't blink or get nervous. She said it like a lion. Continue praising the Lord. He's coming back soon. 
Now I don't know if she's going to see him coming back or her husband. But it really made my heart begin to beat when those words came out of her mouth. And I got into the car and I was driving home. And I begin to think, with what kind of expectation do I live? Like he's going to come back tomorrow or that he's never going to come back? You know, the expectation of the first church was as if he's going to come back tomorrow. They lived as if he was going to come back tomorrow. And, and I, think, I think this showed in the way that they personally sought God. I think this showed in the way the first church began to reach people with such magnitude so fast. It's crazy in the book of Acts when it says many, many, many were added to the church. Just some chapters later, it says many disciples were added. Like you see people being reached and people being discipled so quick, so, in, like, so fast in this church and the growth is exponential. And I think with this is connected an expectancy of the Lord's return. What I want to preach about this, this evening, I almost said this morning, this evening, is a restoration of responsibility. Restoration of responsibility. Don't yawn on me right now. A restoration of responsibility. Turn with me really quick to Genesis 2-7. Let's kind of plant there first, literally in the garden. Plant there first in the garden with what we see God do when he forms man and what he does with man. And then we're gonna just talk really quickly about David. We're gonna talk really quickly about Peter. And then we're gonna end and pray. Look in Genesis 2. And let's read from verse 7. Now, you know, we read Genesis 1, we go through the day 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. On 6, man is made. Genesis 2 almost kind of goes a little bit backwards and starts going into, into some of the detail specifically about man being made. And look what it says in verse number 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in, the Eden, in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and, all, and, all, and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed from the land of Eden. And we're just going to zip through this. It was split into four rivers that would water the whole earth. And then in verse 15 the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. If, um, if we could go, just go through this kind of step by step, it says God formed the man from the dust of the earth. He formed him and he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and this man became a living being. And this is, for us, uh, the Bible is the highest of authority. What we believe, we believe this is how it started. We believe this is how God made man. And what's crazy is God took us from the dust of the earth, and he formed us. And in forming us, he breathed the breath of life into us, and made us a living being. Are you here? Somebody, are you here? I wanna make sure you're listening. And he breathed into him the breath of life and made him a living being. This is our genesis, this is our beginning. Now I want, I don't know about you, but when I read this, I can't help but connect it to the fact of how I or you or all of us are spiritually born. Because when I came to God 13 years ago, it was 2007, I just graduated high school. When I came to God, the best way, like, you know, if, if we're going to get Christianese and kind of talk Bible, the best way to, to kind of explain or, or illustrate my life when I came to him is kind of what the earth looked like in the beginning. It was empty and it was void. 
When I came to God, my life was empty. Though it looked full, though it was busy, though I enjoyed my life, in, in all, in, you know, when the day would be over, when I'd be by myself, I felt empty and I felt like there was a great void in my life and I didn't know. I, didn't, I had so many questions and more questions than answers and that's kind of what my life looked like when I came to him and it's interesting that when we come to God in our emptiness, in, with our void and our brokenness and everything else that looks so messed up, we come to God and God, one of the first things that he does when we respond in repentance and we give our life to him is he brings form back into our life. That emptiness and the void that we have and the things that we try to fill our life with that don't give us fulfillment, don't give us purpose, don't reveal destiny to us, don't reveal who I am to me, and it makes us more and more empty. But when we turn and give our life to God, it's the goodness of God that leads men unto repentance. When God's love is expressed, when God's goodness is shown to you, and you respond by repenting and giving your void, your empty, whatever you call it, to God, he brings form to it. Can anybody testify? I don't know about you, but I didn't come to God having formed my life. I came to God having been empty and having void and brokenness and misunderstanding and confusion, and God gave form to it. And then what he does by his spirit, which is our new birth, is he breathes life into us. He breathes life. It's not just a responding to come to the altar, a praying of a prayer, and then a magic thing that happens, and we are all of a sudden cha change. What happens here is not just a magical prayer. It's the Spirit of God that comes upon a person and brings new life where there is no life. Where a person actually, we, we hear testimonies like, when I gave my life to God and I, and I got saved, it's like the grass was green all of a sudden. It's like the sky became blue. Was, I listened to the bird, you know, weird bird watchers and listeners. But what it's just, what it's showing us is that a person receives life. It's not just coming under a church building or a church name or some denomination. A person is lost and he is found. A person is dead and he is made alive. A person does not see and he begins to see. A person has no desire to live and walks out with a desire to live. Something happens when a person meets God and the Holy Spirit breathes on him. And all of a sudden, the breath of life enters a person. And I think this is where so many, especially young people, I'm preaching to young people. I love to preach to young people more than any other demographic or group, young people. So many young people leave that moment of encounter where there is form that is brought to their life. The Spirit of God breathes upon their life. Things go great for a season, but where so many, and I, this is just something I'm, I've really been thinking about in this last season, and something that maybe we're gonna talk more about going into 2021, is the lack of responsibility that a young person begins to step into, which then cuts off his supply to continue to grow. How many think, how many can you think of that were by your side, that were here, that were, that were serving God, either in the church you came out of or the church that you are here or interns where you came from. How many young people around us who also gave their life to God, also encountered the Holy Spirit, also begin to grow? But that's not enough. Not to say God is not enough. Not to say the Holy Spirit is not enough. But in what God designed, watch what he does with Adam. He gives him form, he gives him life. And in verse eight, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden and there he placed the man that he had made. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and to watch over it. God gave Adam responsibility. Somebody, God gave, I want you to see something, God gave Adam responsibility. Not just, we're not just talking about J-O-B, not just talking about career, not talking about, 
you know, eight to five, God gave Adam responsibility. A lack of responsibility in any person's life is a cancer that begins to grow. He gave Adam responsibility to tend and to watch over the garden that he placed him into. Responsibility now requires, if God gave Adam responsibility, now it requires accountability. Because God gave him something to do. Not just something to blow his time, not just something to fill the day. God gave him a specific responsibility to tend and watch over the garden. God doesn't make us do things that make no sense. God doesn't make us do things that makes us run in circles. God God doesn't make us do things that are just because he's bored. God, when he tells us to do something or when he places us in a place and we have to do something in that place, there's a reason that we have to do it. There's something that begins to happen when we are there doing what God has given us the responsibility to do. Are you here? Uh, somebody, somebody can preach back to me right now. One of the best things that something happens, one of the best things that happened to you in your life, maybe, I'm just, shout back at me if I'm, if I'm right. One of the best things that could have happened to you is when you got a job. <laughs> yeah. If you said, you still need a job maybe. <laughs> I think, I, I think, I think we don't give enough responsibility to younger people than we should. Uh, if in Israel, a 12-year-old boy was considered a man, this guy, this 12-year-old boy, if he was a Jewish boy, knew the five books, knew the five books of Moses. Besides this, was already walking in his father's career. Whether it was tending sheep, whether it was carpentry work, whether it was a fisherman, was already walking in the responsibility of bringing food and helping at home. You look at 12-year-olds today, and I'm, you know, not every 12-year-old, those that are serving in teens ministry, some, some of them, all they know how to do is turn on Xbox and turn Xbox off. You give them a shovel, and they think they don't know what it is, really. This is ancient. Uh, you know, the kids are getting really smart. We have excavators, Dad. Uh, you know, excavators. Have you seen the size of that shovel? Or how about, how about a generation right now that wants the million-dollar idea but doesn't want to put the hard work in and learn how to save, and learn how to have good work ethic, and learn how to have responsibility, and learn how to be accountable to a boss, or, or work for somebody, and work hard at it. When a person doesn't have responsibility, it's a cancer that begins to grow, because it's laziness, it's, it's, it's not being accountable to anybody, it's doing what I want, it's my time, I control my time, and ultimately what you see is a person has form in their life, has the Holy Spirit that gave them life, they're a Christian, they're saved, but because of the lack of, res- lack of responsibility, there is no growth eventually. Eventually, they cut themselves out because the wanting to do whatever I want and wanting to go wherever I want and wanting to be with whoever I want actually turns into doing nothing. And a person ends up finding himself not in the place that God wants him to be where he's tending and watching over, he's actually doing nothing. And I think, I think maybe we have organized church in a way or you've been used to church in a way where you watch and listen but don't do anything, but we don't believe in that kind of church. We believe if God placed us here, it's not for our pastor, it's not just for our leadership team, it's not for people to just organize events, it's for all of us to begin to tend and watch over the place that God put us into. It's crazy, the beginning of David's story is David in his father's house, who's Jesse, tending and watching over sheep. God placed Adam in the garden to tend and to watch over. The beginning of David's story is in his father's house. He's tending and he's watching over the sheep. God has a way, um, God has a way to really just 
navigate us in his own way right to where we need to be. You know, if I, if I look back upon my life, um, when I had just got saved and, you know, if you were to tell me I, I would be married now and have four kids and, and do what I'm doing and have the responsibilities I have and, and, and whatever, everything else that kind of my life entails, I would, I would not believe you. I, would, I had other plans. I wanted to be somewhere else. But it's crazy. When I just got saved, I was here and I was sharing this to the interns. One of the first things in this church that I started doing besides kind of like helping all, really all the young people kind of helped everywhere back in the day. We only had one service in the morning and then our youth service in the evening. And so we were kind of all involved everywhere. But one of the first things that I started doing is I had to show up before service Sunday mornings. Our service was at 11 a.m. And so I had to be here at 10 a.m. And we had a prayer that we did for the church and for the service kind of corporately together at 10. And, and then we would walk into, I would either go before or after, I'd walk into the sanctuary and with the small team of people, we would straighten all the rows out, clean all the garbage under the seats, behind the pockets. Um, I, I'd be shocked to find gum and, you know, your hand hits it and you just want to curse, but you bless everybody that sat there and, and we're straightening the chairs out. We're straightening the chairs out, making them all, you know, lined up and whatnot and just getting things ready. And, and then, and then, uh, you know, all of a sudden I get asked to help organize events with our kind of our team at youth and putting out, putting together parties and different kind of things. And then we're, I'm involved in the life group. I go to a life group for a while. Then I get asked to kind of co-lead the life group. Then I get asked to lead the life group. Um, and then, and then I get asked to preach for the first time. It was a Tuesday service. I, I think I have the day written down somewhere. The first time I preached was actually not at like preach, preach was not at the youth service, but was at a Tuesday prayer service for, it was a 10 minute message. I remember the guest speaker that we had and, and he came out after this like big bulky Russian dude. And he just kind of just told me like, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. And then he preached a word and everybody forgot what I said. Um, and, um, and then all of a sudden, uh, I'm preaching my first full message at youth. Then I'm, for the first time, getting invited somewhere to speak. This kind of blew my mind. I'm like, why, you know, why are they even inviting me? I'm, I'm cool with being here. And, and all of a sudden, this progression, and now I find myself in this place, and I know this is just the beginning of what God has and, and, and what God has called me to do. But it's crazy. It's crazy that I find myself here now uh, not having reached really any dis, de, dis, like, you know, where I want to be or the place that God has called me to be ultimately, but I am here and I'm so grateful to be here. And it's crazy if you were to ask me like, hey, how did you do it? And the interns were asking us these questions in class. Like, hey, you know, how did you step into your calling or how did this happen? Or how did you start preaching or this or this or that? And you really can't put a finger on it, but you just understand that you were in a place that God put you you were responsible in that place. And God, by God, you know, his, on, thoughts are, his thoughts are higher. His ways are higher. He just begins to lead you. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in a place that you never thought you'd be in. You'd never thought was possible. But you're holding a mic. You're preaching the word. The Holy Spirit's upon you. There's boldness. There's authority. There's, there's power behind what you're saying. Because when you were folding the chairs or stacking them, being responsible in that place, and God begins to lead you somewhere else, all of a sudden, you find yourself in a place you never thought you'd be. But you see God's hand upon you, and it started with him first placing you somewhere to give you responsibility. You just don't know how you're going to step in to what God has for you. But I'm telling you, if you're not going to take responsibility for the place that you're at right now, you ain't never going to step into it. You can be anointed, gifted, full of the Holy Spirit, bold, courageous, strong, faith. You, every attribute you got in the Bible. But if you are not willing to take responsibility in the place that you're at and begin to tend and watch over whatever you've got to tend and watch over, you ain't going to walk into what God has for you. And I, th and I, think, I think so many young people are fooled and 
I rebuke the devil and his condemnation and distraction because so many people think, because I got saved, because I'm a part of a great church, I'm just going to flow in to the plans of God, and I'm going to just float into the calling and float into the destiny and flow into the things that God has. But you don't flow in. You walk in because God's leading you, and you're walking because you're doing what God called you to do. And by doing what God called you to do, all of a sudden, you find yourself from point A to point B to point C, point, point D and someone asks you, how'd you do it? You say, I don't know, it's just God. But what you are doing is being faithful in place A and place B and place C, being responsible there where you are serving. And all of a sudden, God, with his hand, is leading you. David just by himself with the sheep, all of a sudden the lion came out and we got a story now. All of a sudden the bear came out and we now do plays for kids. But it was just him and the sheep. And then all of a sudden, dad asks him to take some food to his brothers. And David finds himself before Goliath. And then David finds himself before a king. And then David finds himself playing the harp to help the king be able to run the country. And then David finds himself in a cave. If David did not take care of every single sheep in his father's house, he would have taken off Saul's head in the cave. He was tending over and watching over what God had entrusted to him when he was in his father's house with his sheep. And now, 15 years later, approximately, 16 years later, 17 years later, God is now calling David to lead a nation one of the only characters in the Old Testament who function in the role of a king, a priest, and a prophet. He was tending the sheep, then tending a nation. Now think about Peter. Peter, Jesus calls Peter, I think John is the only account where uh, prior to John we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and we kind of see Jesus go to the Sea of Galilee. He sees Peter, he sees Andrew, he calls him. But John's account says that uh, Andrew is one of the disciples that begins to follow him first, who was following John the Baptist. And Andrew goes and gets his brother Peter, tells him, I, I found the Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for. And Peter meets Jesus because of Andrew. Now, the point is, Peter meets Jesus somewhere about the Sea of Galilee. And he meets Jesus, he's a fisherman. And Jesus tells him, Peter, well, Simon, I now call you Peter, and I want you to follow me. And we, we see this, you know, the story of Peter begin. Peter begins to follow Jesus. He follows him. He, we, you know, we, we remember, the, remember the account where it says he leaves his home, he leaves his father, he leaves, uh, he leaves his wife, leaves his family, his work, and he begins to follow Jesus. And, and it's crazy, this journey begins for Peter. And as he's following Jesus, we see we see Peter kind of take this leadership role, beginning to, lead the, uh, beginning to lead the rest. When Jesus asks them, who do you say that I am? Peter has this revelation from God. We heard, that, heard about that this morning, and he speaks this revelation, and Jesus is like, you just had a revelation from the Father. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, and on this revelation, I'm gonna build a church. Then all of a sudden, after this, Peter doesn't have a revelation. What's the opposite of a revelation? I don't know. De-escalation? What? Not a heavy review, but a heavy. <laughs> he wasn't being prophetic. He was being, no, that's, that's, I heard that so many times and I you need to stop saying that. Basically, like he had a revelation from God and now the devil's speaking through him. Remember? He's like, I'm not gonna let anybody take your life. Get behind me, Satan. And, and, and Peter gets rebuked by Jesus and then we see Jesus, Peter claimed to protect Jesus and not let anything happen to him. He cuts the ear off. John's the only one that lets us know about that. He cuts the ear off the servant. Peter's like, yo, Jesus is like, yo, this is not the way it's gonna go down. He heals the man. And then Peter's in the courtyard by the fire, ultimately betrays Jesus, not once, not twice, three times. And in John, if we pick up in John chapter 21, 
Peter's talking to, his, to the disciples, and he's like, they're asking him, what are you going to do? What are you going to go? And he says, I'm going to go fishing. Peter denied Christ. This is the third time Jesus is appearing to them. So Peter's already seen him res resurrected. But it's just kind of in this unknown, unknown place. And after three and a half years of following Jesus, and you would think he's about to step into now the thing that God has for him, Peter, from what we read, is kind of in a very discouraging place or kind of in an unknown. Like, I don't know what's next. I'm going to go back to what I do know. And it's crazy that when he doesn't know what to do or what's next, he goes back to the Sea of Galilee and he goes back to fishing. Just catch, catch this. He goes back to the Sea of Galilee and he goes back to fishing. And when he's fishing, Jesus shows up at the shore. He tells them to throw the net on the other side. They catch a fish, they catch an amount of fish. It tells us the exact number of fish. When, Jesus, when John, who's writing this, says, it's, G, it's the Lord. He, say, he yells, it's the Lord. When they caught the miraculous amount of fish, it's the Lord. Peter jumps into the water and begins to swim to shore. When he gets to shore, I don't know how, they're catching fish. Jesus is already cooking fish. He's cooking fish. He's making breakfast. The Bible says they, he's making breakfast, and they're, they have breakfast together. And it says they eat and have breakfast together, and then Jesus addresses Simon, who is called Peter. And he says, Max, do you love me? I want everybody to hear this. Max, do you love me? Yes. If Max loves you, you made it in life. I just want you to stand up. When you, can, you, can, you, can you just replay this? And I just like, like a man, I want you to stand up and give me an answer, all right? Max, you know, they're eating, having breakfast. Max, do you love me? Yes. <laughs> okay, can you... Stay standing. Stay standing. Then feed my sheep. David, do you love me? Yes. Guys, I'm the happiest man on earth right now then take care of my sheep. Sasha. Alex. <laughs> you know that I love you. <laughs> Do you love me? Yes. Then feed my sheep. Leon, do you love me? Leah. Leah, Leah do you love me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Say it, say it. Just say it. I just, I, I, you know. I, that makes me feel so good. Okay, st can you stand up? Who else? Tim. Do you love me? Josh? Miriam? Masha? Vladislav. Yeah, that's my boy. Philip, do you love me? Victoria, do you love me? Sophia, my sister, do you love me? I know she loves me. Then feed my sheep. You know, real love is the stepping into of responsibility. This generation does not know what love is. They think love is just words. Love is just promises. Love is just a movie that you watch. Love is just something that you hope to have one day. Real love is the acceptance of responsibility. Because at the response to Jesus, yes, I love you, Jesus gave them all responsibility. And to Peter, we, we call this, 
you know, Peter's reinstatement, his, his reincarnation, not reincarnation, what's it, inauguration. Peter's inauguration in this moment where he is established now as the leader, the, 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 the pastor, the first man of this church that Jesus is gonna start. He gives Peter responsibility to take care, to look over, to feed, to protect. And if you look at the synonyms for all these words, he has to take care of the people that God would give to him as his own. This is Peter's responsibility from heaven. We have a responsibility today to tend and to watch over this house. Some people would get offended when, when we pray for people and I see someone come up who I don't know begins to pray. I tell them to go back to their seat and not pray. Do you know why? Because I have a responsibility to watch over what happens here. I don't know who's laying hands on you. And so we protect this place because we want to know who lays hands on you. We entrust people here to lay hands on you, to pray to you, to minister to you. We know who they are and we know what they're gonna put on you is good stuff. Because we're tending and we're watching over. God has given this to us. Not to just one man. Pastor Sergey, I'm so thankful for a man who is putting no, I love that, I'm, I feel so young. He's putting no cap on young people. He puts no cap on young people. He wants us to take this city. He wants us to, to, take, to take over the church. He wants us to take over everything. He wants us to go farther than he ever went with his team. He wants us to go farther to nations they haven't touched yet. He wants us to go farther to reservations we haven't been at yet. Because when we begin to watch over what God has given us here, God is going to begin to open doors in other places. But if you don't begin to tend where you are now, you'll never tend the greater things that God has. You'll watch the tenders, but you'll never tend yourself. And so right now, if I'm in a life group, I need to begin to tend. If I'm in a department, I I need to begin to tend. If I'm here, I need to begin to tend. I'm not just coming to a church. I'm coming to my home. And my home is worth tending. My home is worth watching over. I don't know about you. I was spiritually born here. I spiritually grew here. I spiritually am who I am because of this church, because of what God did through this house. I owe my life to God and to this house. So for me coming here, it's not my duty, my obligation, it's my responsibility because God has entrusted something to me. 10 years ago, I got a word. One day, you will be in charge of many people. 10 years ago. I don't know if that word is this or the teens that we watch over with the team or the whole youth ministry that we watch over with Pastor Slavic, but that word was spoken 10 years ago. And I'm organizing events and stacking chairs. And God just begins to lead with his hand when you're responsible where you are. You're not just doing something for church. You're doing something for God. God called you. God gave you life. God gave you responsibility. And we, we take it and we say, God, I don't know why you, like Vika was sharing her testimony, I don't know why you called. I don't know why me, but I'm going to be responsible with where you put me. I want you to stand to your feet. Join the rest. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. The less has got less. And then take care of my sheep. Our team that's going to reservations every week, can I, can I have you guys come forward? Just come forward right here to the bottom of the stairs. We're gonna, we're gonna pray for you right now. Our team that goes to reservations, I know some people have joined here and there, but if you, 
have been going pretty consistently or joining Max and the team, I want you to come forward. We're going to pray for you. Yeah, some of our inter- yeah, some of our interns. If you've been joining, it's okay. Come forward. I wasn't able to make it to last week's service. I had to just couldn't make it in. And I was watching the service. And Max was sharing his testimony about what God kind of doing in his personal life and kind of their crazy moment they had at this casino. You know, he would have never done that. Ever. If you, for those of us that know Max, for Max to run into a casino and from east to west in this casino just walk and preach the gospel out loud. If I could be totally honest, from his internship year, he'd be one of the last candidates. He's quieter, he's more to himself. Even when we have close circle meetings, the dude barely says anything. And we're all really jealous because he seems a lot smarter than all of us. Um, But this this team which started just with a couple guys, two, three guys now is turning into something and what's crazy is the beginning of this was just a desire to go do something for God an idea that sparked a passion let's go preach, let's go see what happens if we go to this reservation we don't know what to expect but pastor's been talking about it, our church has been praying about it, let's do it And all of a sudden, Max is now running through casinos preaching the gospel like a madman. Max, you're going to be shocked at how many reservations we begin to go to and how many casinos we're not just going to be running through but having some kind of ministry at. Because what you begin to tend and watch over God begins to lead. When we begin to watch over what God has entrusted us with, when he sees that we're persistent, when he sees that we care, when he sees that we keep doing it, the line didn't come on day one for David. It came later. And when it came, David was ready to defeat that lion. And God was teaching him something there on his own that he had to learn. And I think, I think for this team, there's already been a lot of lion and bear stuff that they're going through on their own. But we're about to slay giants. And I want us to pray. I want us to pray for Max, this team. I want us to pray for people that are going to be joining. We believe, we believe this is a word that our pastor received a long time ago. That Native, Native Americans in our, in our area that are ignored, neglected, kind of in their own concentration camp, you could say. We're gonna start going there and reaching out to them. And we, when pastors shared that the first time, I remember it was just a few conferences ago. And we begin to pray for it at that conference as a church, he announced it. And you could see that fire in pastor's eyes when he's, he knows he heard from God. And all of a sudden there's a fire in my eyes and I'm, we begin to pray as a church for Native Americans. We begin to pray for reservations in our area. And now we're sending teams there. I want us to pray. Father God, I thank you so much. Come on, I want you to, if some of our team can come out and surround them, and I want you to stretch your hands out. If you're, so, if you're in the back, if you're watching, I just want you to stretch your hands out and just begin to pray. Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for the vision that you gave us, God, for the desire that you gave us, for what you placed in this church to do, to reach the Native Americans in our area, to reach these people, God, right there in their reservations right there in the casinos. And we pray, Lord, we pray for our team. And we thank you, God, that they would attend and take care of this in all honesty, integrity, faithfulness, in Jesus' mighty name. We bless them, God, and we thank you for the doors 
that you already started opening and the doors you're gonna continue opening. We bless them. We thank you for strategy. We thank you for, for more clarity when it comes to vision, for the right people joining the team. We thank you for right connections to be made when they're gonna be going to these places. We thank you for doors that are gonna be supernaturally opening. We thank you for more reservations, more casinos. We thank you, God, so much that you're gonna begin to give them a game plan on how to actually start churches, how to start life groups, how to start something in these places they're going to. We thank you, God, that we're not just sowing randomly, but we're gonna begin to sow intentionally, that we're gonna begin to reap a harvest in these places we're going to. And we speak strength, we speak unity, we speak commitment, faithfulness, devotion in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you, God. We thank you that right now we're tending maybe just to a few sheep, but we're gonna be tending to a whole nation in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you, God, so much for doors. They're gonna be blasting open to go into more places to reach more people with a greater team in Jesus' name. Father God, we bless. We bless the Native Americans and we pray right now as a youth group for more and more people to be reached with the gospel, for more and more people to be reached, that you would bring form to their life, that your Holy Spirit would bring, breathe upon this nation in Jesus' mighty name. And we thank you so much, God. We thank you for the responsibility you've given our church to begin to go to these places and preach the word and disciple and raise them up. And we thank you that you're, you give the ability to do this. And we bless our team. We bless them in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, um, I'm going to keep this simple as we go into worship. If you, if the Holy Spirit is, is speaking to you, is convicting you, is touching you, and then you just need prayer in this area, if there's a willingness you have, a willingness you have to step in, one thing I forgot to mention, note that when God gave form to Adam, breathed life into Adam, God had a place for him. His place was in that garden to take care of it and to watch over it. This was his place that God had made for him to grow as a man, for him to grow in every area of his life. For each of us, no matter what you've been told, no matter what you maybe theologically believe about church, each person here has a place within the body. If this is your local church, there's a place here for you. If you are from a different local church, there's a place for you there. You have a place. And it's, sometimes it's just simply our willingness. You know, I didn't really know. I didn't really know, like, what could I in fullness do here? When I was just grabbing chair by chair by chair, and God led me to my place. I now know my place here, what I have to do, the responsibilities I have, and that's what I do before God. And sometimes for you, that next step is just whatever's available for you right there where you are, whether it's volunteering somewhere. I think one of the greatest things that every person has to do is be in a life group, be a part of a life group, or lead a life group. That's where you're like face-to-face -face actually knowing people's names and meeting them and doing fellowship and growing and having some kind of connection outside of services. And if that's where you need to be, that's the next step you need to take and begin to tend and watch over. Be re take responsibility for that place that you're gonna be in. And you will see how you will discover in time, you'll discover your place. You'll discover your gifting. You'll discover the role that you have to play. You'll begin to hear even more clearly God's voice. You'll begin to be able to have discernment. You'll, you'll be able to make the right decisions. You're gonna begin to walk following God is a journey we don't just end up in random places it's a journey it's a it's a process that we have to go through we're walking with him and I think some of us are expecting to leap into certain areas you don't you're not going to leap into certain areas you need to begin to walk right where you are in responsibility God has called you God called you by name and has a specific plan for you I want I don't know about you but I want Sometimes it's the greatest, it's the greatest privilege to know confidently where I am, God wants me to be. Where I am, God wants me to be. And you begin to be responsible with what God placed in your life there where you are. And he begins to supernaturally lead you. 
If you've got a willingness to say, God, I want to step in to what you have for me, that place, that anointing, that role, I want to know what that is. When we begin to worship, I want you to come to the front, not responding to me, responding to God, and just bow your heart in humility before God. It's the sincerity of your prayer and your heart before God that God really begins to touch and answer. So if there's a sincere desire, God, I want to be where you want me to be, God's going to meet you. God's going to begin to touch you. God's going to give some of you desire right now for what you need to do next. Some of you are going to make decisions right now before you leave on what's next for you, on what step you need to take, because it's up to you to step in to what God has for you. God is making the invitation. Father, I pray for every single person right now, those watching and those here, and I thank you so much for the place that you have for every person the role that you have for every person, the responsibility that you have for every person. You don't just, you don't just call, you don't just call one man to do everything. You call a body to begin to play its role. And I thank you for the role that each person here is called to play right where they are. And we pray right now, Father, any person that has lost sight of what you have, lost sight, lost faith, lost even hope, lost, maybe even purpose, something that's driving them to live. We pray that you would restore responsibility today before they leave. Restore responsibility, the weight, the heavenly weight of what you have called us to do in Jesus' mighty name. We're not just serving one another. We're not just serving this church. We're serving you, God. And we want to be faithful with the responsibility that you've given us. We pray for our church right now, and we pray for the local churches in this area. We pray that we would take the responsibility that you have for us as your church. We are your witnesses to preach your gospel. We are the light to shine in this city. We are the salt to be working in this place. And we thank you that you have called us, that we are not just floating around, that we're not just living purposeless, purposeless lives, that you have a calling for us. And we wanna walk in that calling. We wanna take responsibility for our city, for this nation, for the people in our neighborhoods. In Jesus' mighty name we pray that responding to you is not just saying, God, use me. It's saying, God, use me for the people that need you. God, use me for the people that don't know you. We take responsibility for our city, for this church, for this area. We don't just care about ourselves. We care about those that are around us. You have called us to carry the burdens of those that are walking with us. You have called us to be the light to those that don't know you. You have called us and given us responsibility to open our mouth and preach the gospel to be witnesses here where we are in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, respond to God and say, God, I'm taking responsibility. Restore it in my life. Restore it in my life. Come on. Use us, God. Use us, God. We desire to be faithful. We desire to take what you've entrusted us with. Come on, let's cry out. 